for the movie, documentary, music video, hot licks. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Hot licks, documentary. Documentary, hot licks. The Palomino Club of North Hollywood, California. The other Mr. Anderson is. <laughs> Ron Anderson about a criminal case. Oh, my word. Oh, that is criminal. But it's funny because she said, no, but the other Mr. Anderson is. I said, am I a criminal? No, but he is. And they're representing him. They know he's a criminal. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. What's his name? He don't No, just another Anderson. Mm-hmm. What's the way Anderson's around? Oh, yeah. I found that it's the most common name. One of my... More than Smith and Jones, they said. More Anderson. One of my aunts married into the Anderson. Really? Yeah, I always I see him. I say, where are you from? I try to figure out, you know, but... Oh, no, there's no. I mean, my, and people have their names changed. And, you yeah. Know, and, and well, Anderson's not a name you change. No, it's not. <laughs> too much. Not too much. Uh, well, my brother married a girl named Caldwell. Uh-huh. And my, my grandmother's uh, maiden name was Caldwell, but it was spelled different. Wow. So I used to kiss my brother. Oh, Mar- okay. Married his cousin. Yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> Not related at all. It was funny, you know? Yeah. Okay. Um... From the beginning, just tell us about the, your experiences with the Palomino and South Baker School. Okay. I mean, the, when I, I, I came to Los Angeles in 72, and um, it was still, like, at that point, the premier honky-tonk on the West Coast. It was the club to play when you came to Los Angeles. And uh, I remember, you know, hearing about it and going out there, um, and I was it was young, I was very young in my career as a musician. The band was a terrific band. I I can't I it must have been I think it was Jerry Inman and the Palomino Riders, um, and I don't remember who the individual musicians were. Uh, probably it might have been Glendy Harden. Uh, some of those guys that were in the Elvis band might have been in that band at that time. And just you know it sounded like a record. I mean it was just so strong and the band was great. And I remember the. Uh, the uh, neon lights over, or the black lights over this over all the posters, and you'd see like Waylon Jennings, Johnny Cash, you know Mel Tillis, all the people that were you know going to come and play the Palomino, because uh, country was still in the clubs then. It was still in the honky tonks, you know state fairs, package shows, but it wasn't at it wasn't in theaters and it wasn't in arenas and these guys toured in their buses and these were the places they played and they played to like anywhere from five to seven hundred whatever they could cram into these clubs and play and that was like probably the peak the peak time uh, of of that kind of music. I mean, it's it it went up from there. The music started to change a bit on a, the general level. Country music and urban cowboy appeared to be a savior, but it didn't really was more of a crushing blow to kind of end country music the way that the way that we really knew it. But the Palomino was the premier club. It was the place to play um, on the West Coast. Um, there was one in San Jose, and I mean, they were dotted up and down the West Coast. I mean, there actually used to be a lot of honky tonks, but it was probably one of the most famous famous clubs. I mean, if you got to play the Palomino, you'd made it. Um, that was the vibe. If you were in the house band, you were like one of the hottest musicians in town playing country music. Um, so I, I remember going out there and uh, you know just kind of being in awe of the whole scene, and you know I was very young and uh, just listening to the music and. I was really, at that point, really into blues a lot and not thinking that I would maybe ever play there. You know, I was, like, so far uh, removed, you know, from, like, some little dumpy biker bar I'd be playing in that, you know, like, wow, if you played the Palomino, you had it made or you were, you'd made it. So those were really my first impressions of it when I, when I first came here. Seventy-two, yeah, spring of seventy-two, May, June, right around there. Then I I took a road gig. I went on the road with a band, and we went to Canada and toured around and stuff, and started on a different kind of track. I played a lot of blues, a lot of country, kind of back and forth between the two. Um, uh, 
through the 70s. Um, and then the Palomino, uh, things started to change. The club scene started to change. Um, country music started to change. It got bigger. It got more pop. And uh, Tommy Thomas, uh, I, I guess the life expectancy perhaps, I don't know, but I've been told the life expectancy of a club is about five years. And you can imagine, I don't know what year the Palomino opened, but the guy had an amazing record, you know, of keeping that club open and 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 vibrant. Um, and he shifted over, and he started booking whatever acts that were on that five to seven hundred seat level. So then it went from more of a real. When I got here, it was a real straight honky tonk country western bar uh, to. Uh, kind of a mid-level club that was a showcase club where Tower of Power might play. Uh, any number of bands coming up or coming down, depending on, you know, the, the situation um, that could fit the the uh, seating capacity and the money that was available. So it started to broaden as a club. And I think some people, I think the original country fans were probably a little bit taken back, but country was... That the way we knew it was really starting, you know, it was dissipating. I mean, we, I don't think anybody knew it was dissipating because you had Waylon and Willie and you had a lot of great things happening. But the, the face of it was changing. Um, country music was pulling out of Los Angeles. There was no label representation anymore. It used to be Hollywood. Uh, Capitol Records, uh, the country division was in Hollywood. It wasn't in Nashville. And Warner Brothers' country division was in Burbank. It wasn't in Nashville. So there was that whole different thing of Merle and Buck and the things that were being made at Hollywood and Vine and then the Burbank stuff with Emmy Lou Harris and things of that nature, um, the way they were doing it uh, from a West Coast perspective, um, which kind of tended to separate it and keep the music from being as homogenized as it is today, where today it's very... Mm, everyone seems to be pretty much interchangeable, the singers and the music. Um, and it's it's partially, I think, uh, a thing of like, Nashville's not a big city, and you have uh, so many musicians available uh, and so many sessions available, and the best musicians play on all the same records. And even though they're great musicians, they're not going to be different on every record. You got basically five guys that mix all the records, you know, seven or eight studios that make all the records. So that it's like if if all country music was made in Glendale, Burbank, it would it would start to all sound the same. The same. They'd all call. Oh, we got to get this drummer. There'd be like three drummers you'd use. There'd be like four guitar players you'd use. So it, I mean, it's not like it's anybody's fault. I mean, when all the cars were made in Detroit, you had what you had with the automobiles. You know, they were all fairly similar. Um, but back then, it was a lot more creative and a lot more artist-driven than publisher-song-driven, and in a way a lot less commercially driven. I think they were satisfied with uh, having the longevity of a career as opposed to, I've got to sell a, a multi-platinum, uh, which has destroyed it and changed the face of it. But the Palomino changed with the times um, and became a showcase club, and Tommy figured a way to make it survive uh, as long as it did, which was really amazing. Um, by the time uh, the early 80s rolled around in the late 70s, uh, what happened here was that the Urban Cowboy thing came out, the movie, everybody went Urban Cowboy, I'm sure it happened all over the United States, bars in Encino that were steakhouses were country bars. Um, there was more uh, people with cowboy hats on backwards and and uh, and fry boots, you know, with the round toes walking around. Kind of, you know, it was funny to see. It was really funny to see. Um, it was it was very costume like. But and I was playing playing a lot of country at that time. Um, but what happened was is that it expanded too fast, and when it collapsed, it collapsed further the boundary shrunk instead of it coming back to where it was where there was like a handful of healthy honky tonks in the valley where you could go at any night and just hear really good country western music a lot of them got destroyed they couldn't they couldn't stay open um, because after it contracted the palomino always stayed open it became more of a showcase club um, and i had prior to this uh, hooked up with dwight and we had started playing clubs wherever we could this was in 81, 82 maybe, um, and we were just playing for 30, 40 bucks a night with a four-piece band, um, playing bars, 
and then even at that time it was like man if we could get a gig at the Palomino if we could and then you didn't even get paid that was he he started the ticket thing where he'd give you some tickets to go to sell the tickets and uh you you try to get some people in and of course you never sold enough tickets to make any money uh but the important thing you know in retrospect was is that the club stayed open and there was a place to play back then you might be going you know if you were used to getting paid 30 bucks a night to play a honky tonk um, then you'd go and play and you didn't get any money. You were kind of like, well, you know, I need to make some money doing this. But, you know, now another 20 years later, you're like, you know, I would have played it for free to help help keep the club open because there is no club and there is no breeding ground. And, you know, you have to have a place to go and play. So consequently, you know, in retrospect, it was just, we were just fortunate that it was still there and that we could go there and play. Uh, so... We started, you know, playing clubs around town, and as the urban cowboy thing started to kind of crumble and come apart um, in the valley where all the line dance clubs were, all these young kids started playing what was called cowpunk um, in Hollywood in all the rock clubs. And they were exploring the next step from what was called punk music was they were exploring George Jones and, and Wanda Jackson. And they weren't very good musicians, and they weren't really devoted to learning how to play country music or had no heritage, but their hearts were in the right place, and they were playing what they thought was kind of revved up country music. Well, Dwight and I, the band that we had, we were trying anything we could to get, you know, I knew that the people that reviewed bands and the only way you got press in the newspaper was to play in Hollywood. There was nobody from the Times or at that time the Herald Examiner or, or any of those papers that were going to come to a little bar in Granada Hills or Canoga Park and review a country band that was playing from 9 to one thirty, singing other people's songs. So you had to be in a showcase situation. Now we were offered a, so, a showcase situation playing cowpunk or in our case what we did with country music or Dwight songs or revved up honky tonk or whatever you want to call it so we just lied our asses off and said yeah we're cowpunk whatever that is sure we're cowpunk because we saw that these bands were in there they were playing they weren't very good and a bunch of people were there and it was the hip crowd meaning the younger people that buy records and you know love music and the writers were coming because that's where they went to review shows and bands to hopefully discover the next big thing so we started to get on these shows uh with uh like the hollywood hillbillies uh, uh the biggest one was lone justice because maria mckee was uh getting a lot of press at the time and she had a band that was kind of a country rock band. It wasn't really a country band. And she, had, she was very young, very attractive, and had a great voice, and she was getting a ton of press. Well, because of the press, these showcase clubs, they would go play for an hour and a half, do their set of original music, and the place would be packed. So we were like, man, if we could just kind of steal their crowd, let their crowd see what we do. And Dwight was great at talking on the phone. He would talk to anybody for hours about anything. So he was sort of like, the booking agent. I mean, you know, I was the guitar player, he was the singer, he was the songwriter, I was the producer, arranger, uh, he was the booking agent. I sort of was like behind the scenes kind of like, because I was older, kind of managing, or, or not managing, but we could talk about things and say, hmm, we should try this strategy, or if we could get that guy to see us play, or if we could get Todd Everett, who wrote for the Herald Examiner, to see us play and write about us, and all these connecting the dots kind of thing, and he would just go after him. He would call Todd Everett up. He'd call Bill Bentley up, these, the writers, Judy Raphael, and just talk for hours to him about music. Um, so they started to come to see us play, and the catalyst gig for us was the Palomino. Um, I had discovered a guy in Hollywood who was uh, pressing up records. It was all vinyl back then, and it was called P&D, which was called Promote and Distribute or Press and Distribute, whatever. These guys would take your tape, um, they would pay for the artwork and the pressing of the albums and put them out, pay you a royalty, and uh, put your record out. It was like independent put your own records out so consequently I had found this guy from another project I was working on so and I was working in this other band that I had and a blues band and with Dwight and we had sort of given up playing clubs now for 40 bucks a night from 9 to one thirty, because oddly enough everyone we played we got fired from which is a great story because if we worked two nights 
we would play one. If we worked four, we would play two. It did not matter. We played the five or six clubs that were left in the valley, left to us to play from 9 to 130 Honky Tonks. And we would go in and we would play Merle Haggard, we would play Bill Monroe, we'd play Bluegrass, we'd play a bunch of Dwight songs. And invariably, before the end of our little engagement, whether it was a two-day, two-night or four-night, we would get fired because we didn't play popular stuff that was on the jukebox, which was Alabama or I can't even remember what it was at that time. And it would be, invariably, I would be walking in the door of the bar with my guitar and Dwight would be coming out the door with his guitar and I'd go, what are you doing? He'd go, yeah, fire. And throw all his gear in the back of he had an El Camino at the time. And I'd be like, you know, what are we doing? What happened? Well, we didn't play enough popular music. Now, this is the same band that's on Guitars Cadillacs. And we were playing some of the same songs that were that was on Guitars Cadillacs um, that is now, I don't know if it's triple platinum, it's a double platinum record. So there's not a lot of opportunities in your life where you get to have a little payback, where the guy that fired you from the club is now not only playing your song that you played there for 30 bucks on the jukebox, but is now demanding the band that's mostly your buddies to play your song. And, it, and that was a good feeling. That was a, that's a very unique thing, I think, to ever have happen in your life. And we had that happen. It was, it was, it was very uh, it was satisfying, I mean, to, to knock, knock around in the clubs that long. Uh, and not that club owners are bad, but they, you know, they're, they're businessmen. They're not expected to be A&R people or music, musicologists, and most of the time they're not. So the, Pal- the Palomino became a catalyst gig for us because I had approached this guy named Tab Rex, who was putting out these records. And uh, I said, uh, w- Dwight somehow got us had made friends with Tommy because we'd played a bunch of free shows at the PAL to sporadic crowds, um, and we were getting a little press. And he had persuaded him to let us open the show for Lone Justice at the peak of their local excitement. So uh, the place was packed. You couldn't get in. This guy, I told Tab Rex, I said, I said, yeah, you know, I said, we're... We're going to play the Palomino, whatever night it was. I can't remember. And I didn't say we were opening or anything. I just said, we're playing the Palomino. It's this band. This guy's a great singer. You know, uh, we've made, uh, we've gone in the studio to make, we've decided to make an EP, a six-song record that was still 12 inches. It would take rack space as as an album, but we had six songs on it. And we had pursued this. That took us two years. That's a whole other... uh, segment of the show here to talk about that. But anyway, um, so he was like, oh, yeah, Palomino, okay, yeah, I know where it is, yeah, whatever it was. Thursday night, I'll be there. I'll come out and see you guys. He came out, couldn't get in, and he saw our name on the marquee. So he thought everyone was there to see us. He didn't know anything about Lone Justice. So there were some people there to see us, but the place was packed because the Times and the, and the, the Weekly and all the magazines were hyping Lone Justice. So he just thought... This Dwight Yoakam's got to be the hottest ticket in town. And, you know, I mean, reality, maybe 50 people were there to see us, and 575 were there to see Maria McKee. So he was like, he called me the next day, you know, and he's like, I said, hey, his name is Tab. I said, I said, uh, I, said I didn't see you at the gig. He goes, I couldn't get in. There were so many people there to see you. And I didn't say a word. I want to do this. Huh? Let's make this, put this record out, blah, blah, blah. So we had struggled for two years. We made this record. We gave it to him. Another twist is that at the time, his secretary was a girl named uh, Jeanette Napolitano, who later went on to start a band called Concrete Blonde and become very successful. But at this time, she was a young girl who had interned at A&M Records and had come to work for him. So she had this whole list of all the writers in the United States to send our record to. Um, and back then, they would package up albums in boxes and mail them out to Chicago, Detroit, all the major cities to the major newspapers for review. I found in my career that most writers are really the last stopgap of people in the loop 
um, that seem to have music collections or if they write for music for a newspaper, they're usually very educated. I've had great discussions with most of them so that they've been able to talk intelligently with me about music. Um, now, I've made music my life and I've studied it for my life. I'm not like that I know more than anybody, it's just that's what I do, and I'd be able to talk with them, and they would come up with very astute questions, and you could tell by talking to them, they really knew what they were talking about. So these writers would open these boxes and see all these punk records, and, you know, Hell Comes to Your House, Rodney Bingenheimer, and Surf This, and that, and, you know, blah, 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 and then a country record. Well, if you can imagine, whatever this was, 84 maybe, nobody had made an independent country record. I mean, Sugar Hill and Rounder, but they were they were independent, but they were somewhat established. These guys had seen that stuff. This was a record, an EP, coming out of the quote-unquote cowpunk scene from Los Angeles, and uh, in a box full of records with a bunch of other just like radical rock, punk rock, whatever you want to call it. So, of course, immediately they would put this record on. And fortunately, they were really blown away by it. We got a ton of press. No publicist could have got us the press that we got on that record. So because of that one night at the Palomino and getting to open and, and that guy thinking that we were drawing all the people, um, he put the record out for us. It, we made up a label called Oak. It was It's the Oak EP. Guitars Cadillacs was the title. The song Guitars Cadillacs was not on the record. Barry Me was not on the record. Honky Tonk Man was not on the record. Um, and uh, we put it out, and it was it got us really a record deal, and got the Blasters interested in us. Who uh, Steve Berlin was playing with the Blasters at the time. He saw us at the Palomino, saw us play, and said, "Hey, I want you guys to open for the Blasters. We're doing all these shows." Um, so the Palomino was a huge catalyst uh, in my life and Dwight's um, as a source for us to, you know have the opportunity to make a living doing what we love to do. Um, so in, then from from that point on, you know, the club changed a little more. Um, Ronnie Mack came in, started doing the barn dance. Initially it was broadcast live uh, out of Cal CS, Cal CSUN or something. Yeah. Um, and uh, we would go down there. I would go play the barn dance, sit in, um, it was a. I mean, it was like if I hadn't, if I'd be on the road with Dwight, or I had been away, all I had to do was walk in the barn dance on Tuesday night, and I'd catch up on everything. Every it was like, hey, oh, I've seen this guy, that guy, this guy. This is what's going on. It was like a community meeting. It's like a town hall meeting. Everybody was there, and it was a great vibe. It was a collection of that type of people or, you know, those those type of music fans that would get together, which now they go to Jack Sugar Shack, but. The pal was big. There was still, there was still the stigma, or, or you know, the the kind of auspicious quality of like I played the Palomino. I played the Palomino. It, it always, always had that quality to it. Of um, it was something special if you got to play there. Uh, so it was, it was an amazing, amazing time for us, uh, and an amazing. Uh, Opportunity. It gave us a it gave us an opportunity, and Dwight and Tommy got it to be really great friends. And you know, um, while while he was still alive, and and he was a, a big proponent of uh, helping Dwight, helping our career. That's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, we talk about, about the album? The album, and uh, you know, we'll play the and we'll play the kind of cafe. Uh, okay. We'll play the music scene there, man. Yep. Um, I had produced the EP for Dwight, and I had a, a friend named Ron Gowdy who was working for Enigma Records, and he um, had approached me uh, with a fellow that at the time I hadn't met named Dan Fredman. Dan Fredman was doing um, intern A&R work for Enigma, which meant for free, he would come into Enigma Record, pick up a huge box of cassettes that had been sent to them, go home and listen to them and come back and say, this one's good, these suck, throw them in the trash. So Dan had the idea, he said, you know, there's a bunch of bands around, and I would like to, you know, he went to Ron Gowdy, who was working at Enigma, and said, what if we did a compilation record of all these kind of cowpunk bands in Los Angeles? 
Um, and Ron Gotti said, hey, that's a good idea. You know, he sort of was aware of the scene a little bit. He was doing a lot of rock, though, at the time. And then I had known him years before. We had just, like, hooked up musically many years before. And so he knew about the Dwight record and what I had just, just done recently. So he said to Dan, have you ever produced a record? And Dan says, no. And he said, well, let me call. He said, Pete Anderson's a friend of mine, blah, blah, blah. He plays guitar, he plays with Dwight. We were just getting started. Let me call him and see if he'd like to be involved in this. So he called. I met Dan. Ron was like, yeah, let's do this thing. It's very exciting. And, and Dan and I molded around, and, and we started with like, well, let's try to get these certain bands. And he had these tapes. And then he was like, well, maybe, we should, maybe it should be just a little bit more, a little bit more traditional. Um, and not so much cow punk, you know. Uh, so we went out to see some bands play. Uh, we had already worked with the Lonesome Strangers, Dwight and I, so I knew about them. I knew about Kathy Robertson. I don't know. It's, is this the first one? This is this is yeah. This is volume two. Um, yeah, the the first one was uh, Rosie Flores. Uh, was on it, The Lonesome Strangers, Dwight Yoakam, um, Katie Moffat. Uh, I can't remember all the names of the people that were on it, but it was it was all significant people that were playing here in Los Angeles on the scene. So we sort of wandered through it and picked what we thought would be the best situation. Uh, Enigma, at the time, was working with Mad Dog Studios in Venice. They were. They had an account with them, and they were doing work with them. And the owner of that studio, the co-owner of that studio, was Dusty Wakeman, who I had never met. And he said, I have this studio that we could do this record at. It's called Mad Dog, and Dusty's my friend, and he's a good engineer, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, cool, okay. So I went and met Dusty, saw the studio. It was just a little storefront on Lincoln Boulevard. Um, and he was like, great, this will be a lot of fun. And I mean, and, and we were all... Uh, pretty still very wet behind the ears, all of us, whether it was Dusty as an engineer, me as a producer, Dan Fredman as an A&R, fledgling producer uh, kind of thing. But fortunately, um, the cowpunk scene, the demise of the demise of urban cowboy and the, and the kind of resurgence of the younger people getting involved in country music, at that period it was a it was like L people wanted to come to l a there were no there were no places to break in in nashville um Austin, perhaps at the time austin's always been a great music town, but it's not like you would break out of Austin at least not at that point. It was very local stuff. you could be a local hero in Texas and in Austin, but it didn't translate so a lot of very talented people had come to come to l a They were either here for one reason or another, maybe they had they were a little bit over the line and a little more twangy in country than they were rock, and they f were closed out because nobody came out here to look for talent. Um, talent was, at that point, all in Nashville, and you had to go to Nashville, and you had to kind of work the Nashville scene to be heard. You had to have a Nashville attorney or a manager that was connected in Nashville. You could be the be the greatest artist in playing clubs out here and just would never, ever be heard from because they didn't really talent scout other than what was brought to them at that time. So at least not in Los Angeles, for sure. So uh, we got together. We decided on the people. I put a core band together, um, which was myself, uh, John Masseri uh, on drums, um, Skip Edwards uh, on keyboards. I played the guitars. Who played bass? Was it... I know Dusty... Dusty's a really good bass player. I can't remember if Dusty played bass or not. I have a feeling he engineered it. And I don't remember. It might have been Paul, Paul Marshall. I can't remember. I'd have to look at the credits. Uh, but anyway, we put, we put a core band together. To, well, Dan Fredman played bass, too. He was a bass player. Um, we had an abundance of bass players. But anyway, we put a core band together to, for people that didn't have a band. It'd be like, okay, you know, bring us your song. We'll earn your song. We'll we'll uh, do your song. If you have parts of a band, we'll merge them together. If you have your own band, then bring your own band. But it's got. To, we have so much. We were doing two songs a day, um, and it had to move. 
And, and I think uh, just due to the fact that uh, everybody, you know, was so excited about doing the project, the talent pool was really strong. Um, that I guess it must have been like five days we were done. We did two songs a day. I can't remember if there's 10 or 11 songs on there. But um, it went really fast, and we made it. And, you know, in retrospect, it became a real, the initial one became a document of the scene at the time. The record traveled all over the world. Um, and that, again, was, was a, the Palomino had a big part in that because it was a breeding ground. It allowed all those people played the Palomino. They played on showcase nights where they were allowed to get up there, you know, in a big club with recognition, writers in the house, PA, lights, blah, 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 and do original music. They weren't up there singing, you know, what was on the radio. They got to kind of, you know, show their wares. Of, this is what I do. Um, and so it was extremely important that the club was there for that at that time uh, and sort of spawned all these acts. All these acts had the same vibe about, I really would like to play the Palomino. It meant a lot. And then they got to play it, and then they continued to play it. So the record came out. Um, I have no idea how many copies it sold. Uh, I don't think it's in print anymore. I'd love to put it back out on Little Dog Records, like under Little Dog Classics, and make it available, but I have to find the owner. Do the tapes got Enigma got bought and this switched around, and, you know, it, the tapes are here. I own the tapes. I mean, I don't own the tapes. I have the 2-inch, but and I might even have the mixes, but... I don't know who owns them, so I, I could get sued if I put them out without making a deal or finding out who's who. Consequently, um, a, a funny story is is that I, not a couple years after that, maybe a year and a half, I was two years after I was in Norway and I was doing a record with a guy in Norway, and it was kind of a vacation. He was a Norwegian artist. I toured Norway uh, with Dwight, and it was a really beautiful country, and. Um, a guy asked me to come over there and produce a country record on a Norwegian artist, and, and they would pay me. And it, so I took my son, and I took Dusty, became my engineer from that session. We worked together for many years after after that initial project. <clears throat> and um, we went to Norway, and we made a record with this guy named Jan Dahlen, who actually has a song sung by Dave Durham on Volume 2. Jan Dahlen wrote, wrote the, uh, the song, so it's got an international flair. But anyway... I went there and I was doing some interviews. They were saying, you want to do some press and this and that. And, you know, Pete Anderson, but because now Dwight, had, we'd had a couple records out and, you know, there was some splash about, you know, who I was and what Dwight and I had done. And I met with this writer and he said, do you know that in our country, in Norway, we speak of country music in terms of before Bakersfield and after Bakersfield, meaning the record. So the record had that much impact on the country crowd in Norway that it was like, uh, you know, ADBC, I guess. I don't know, you know, but it was like, you know, well, I had a band and I did this and that. Was, was that before Bakersfield? Before you heard of Town South of Bakersfield? Or after Town South of Bakersfield? So it was a real demarcation line. And I remember him telling me that and I was like, wow. And it was like, that's pretty amazing it's, that it had that impact. And you do these things. You know, and you never know where they're going to end up, or whose hands they're going to be in, and what kind of impression they're going to make. And that's why, you know, they're uh, they're immortal. You know, unless the world ends, they're going to be around forever. And uh, you have to keep that in mind when you make them. You know, you have to have you got to be making this stuff for the right reasons, and put you know the right amount of effort into it, uh, because it will be there with your name on it. You know, forever. And, you know, it ended up in Norway. That's a great place. Yeah, it's beautiful there, yeah. Surprising. Wow. I mean, if you looked on a map and you said, if I went to Europe, I want to go to Spain or Greece or warm places, you'd say, I don't want to go up there. But they have a, a there's a warm um, stream of water in the ocean that runs up, oddly enough, by the coast that keeps the temperature fairly moderate in the fall. I mean, it gets, they get to the severe winters, and they're way up north, but it's not as brutal as it would be, you know, August, I mean, uh, October. So I was there in September, October, and it was it was like being in Chicago or, you know, a northern U.S. city, and they're much farther north. 
but they speak really good English. The food is good. They love American music. Um, Oslo is a beautiful city. So it was it was really uh, really enjoyable. Locked up in her own world, I can almost hear her cry.